Hello, my name is Ariel Sealing. I'm a science fiction and fantasy author, um, and today I'm going to be talking about selling books in a digital world. Um, specifically, as authors, we have to sell books. We don't have to, but most of us want to. Um, and a lot of selling and buying takes place on the internet. So, how can we do so in an effective way? Um, yeah. So, uh, first things first, if you want to sign up for my newsletter, I'm going to put a link in the description of this video. Um, also, I have a Discord server. If you're interested in connecting with other writers, we run sprints. We talk about writing and editing and publishing. We're primarily indie authors, um, but most of us have like a pretty diverse, um, you know, diverse goals and uh, processes. And so there's lots of different types of authors in the group. And you're welcome to join us if you are interested in doing so. Um, I also recently started doing pre-made cover design, if that's something that you're interested in. Um, it's under margohawthorne.com, and I will put a link to that in uh, the description as well, so you can check that out if you're interested. So I want to start this lecture, workshop, video <laughs> by talking about what marketing actually is. Um, I think a lot of people kind of have a general idea about marketing, right? They're like, oh, you know when you think of marketing, you think of like, it's social media or it's, you know, I don't know, paying for ads, right? Um, but at its very core, at the most basic, marketing is simply communicating with a potential buyer about your product. And in our case, in the case of authors, marketing is communicating with potential readers about your books, right? Um, so the way that I like to think about it, and of course, it's a huge topic of conversation and marketing is, um, so you can talk about it however you want. But the way I like to think about it is that there's two primary avenues um, for marketing your work. One is what I like to call IRL marketing. And if you are not familiar with millennial slang, IRL stands for in real life. So in real life uh, marketing. And then the other is digital marketing. So mostly what I'm going to focus on today is digital marketing, um, but I just wanted to talk very briefly about IRL marketing just to provide a little bit of context for everything else that I'm going to talk about. So IRL marketing in real life marketing is think of it as communicating with your customers face to face, communicating with readers in the real world. Now, there might be a digital component, you know, maybe you have to fill out a form online or, you know, I don't know, maybe you're, you're posting about your event online, but the actual communication between you and your readers is taking place in real life. So this could include something like going to a conference and selling your books there, um, maybe doing a book signing or book reading. Um, it could be, you know, attending a, a craft fair or giving a workshop. It might also be something like paying for a billboard, which I don't necessarily recommend. It's very expensive, but that would be in real life because the communication is happening in your day-to-day -day life or in their day-to-day -day life, right? Um, it might be putting signs up in your front yard instead of a political sign. You have a sign that says, I sell books, check them out. Um, maybe you put magnets on your cars. Maybe you have flyers that you're printing or you're handing out or you're hanging up at a library or something. Um, it might be snail mail, you know, like actually sending a newsletter through the mail. Uh, I don't actually know very many authors that do this, but a lot of companies still do. Um, so there's a lot of options for IRL marketing. But these are things that are all happening in real life. They're tangible. They're face to face. Um, digital marketing is when your communication with your potential reader is happening online. It might be happening on Facebook. It might be happening through a paid ad. It might be happening via email. It might be happening via video or live stream, but it's happening on the internet. You are in front of your computer somewhere and they are somewhere else in front of their computer, right? Digital marketing. Um, so uh, why digital marketing? Um, I'm going to try to sell you on digital marketing because uh, a lot of people, especially if you are a millennial or older, a lot of your life, you grew up with this idea of like physical marketing. You know, you're having a yard sale, you walk around town and you hang up flyers for either your yard sale. You um, 
I don't know, you put signs in your front yard, you, I don't know, a lot of the stuff I did as a kid for, you know, raising money for band and stuff, it was all in person, right? It was talking to people, connecting with people in, uh, in real life. And online marketing didn't really, it didn't affect my life until I was probably a senior in high school, if not in college. Um, although I know that that's different for different people, depending on your access to technology or whatever. Anyway, that's boring. So why digital marketing? Why do I think digital marketing is worth investing in? So I'm going to give you some pros and cons. All right. So my first pro, the reason why I think you should invest in digital marketing is because it is scalable and it is scalable in a way that IRL marketing is not. For example, in real life, most likely you're going to be selling printed copies of your books. So here I have an example. This is one of my books. But in order to get this, I have to pay for this book to get printed and delivered to me. Um, and so that is a pretty significant upfront cost. And I'm only going to be able to pay for a certain amount of them um, unless you are independently wealthy and you can pay for as many copies as you want. Most of us are going to have limitations. And then once you have these copies, you actually have to physically deliver these to people. Now that could look like shipping it through the mail, but it most likely means that you're going to a craft beer, you're going to an event, and there's going to be costs associated with that. So it's more expensive to move copies of these books, just like in general. Um, you also have to sell them for more, which means that because of all of the excess costs, which means that it's going to be harder to convince people to buy them. Um, as opposed to selling digital copies of your books, like eBooks, infinitely scalable. As many people as you can convince to buy your book can, can buy your book. There's no limitations on how many copies you have printed. Um, there's no limitations on upfront costs for the most part. If you can get your book in front of people and they want to buy it, there's just an infinite number of copies available. So it is it is scalable. There's no ongoing cost to produce. Once it's it's produced, it's just available. Um, you have a lot of different options for distribution, right? There's no shelf life for most books. I guess if you're writing about the dot-com boom, <laughs> how to be successful in the dot-com boom, maybe there's a shelf life, right? Uh, but generally for most books, especially fiction, we're still reading books that are hundreds and, of, and thousands of years old now. So there's no, not really any shelf life. Um, so there's no ongoing cost to produce. There's no shelf life. Once the book is created, it's created and you can continue to distribute it digitally to anybody who wants a copy. Um, a second pro is you have a much wider audience. When you're doing IRL things, marketing, in real life marketing options, you really can only sell the book to people who are in the same place as you are for the most part um, or who see your in real life marketing um, options. And for the most part, that's going to be people who live close by or not too far away or at least accessible by mail or signage, right? With the internet, you can sell books to people all over the world. I have sold books to people in over a hundred different countries. And I've only been to like four or five countries in my life, and but I've sold books in, in over a hundred. So you have a much wider audience because while it might cost a lot of money to ship an actual like physical book to, you know, India or South Africa or Scotland, right? A digital copy, you can distribute pretty much anywhere in the world and the costs are minimal. They might not even be more than shipping it to someone in the same country that you live in. In my case, the United States. The third reason is wider audience, but also a more specific audience. So in your local community, most likely is going to be a certain type of person that lives. Now, there's there's definitely some diversity in terms of like personality or whatever. But let's say that you write like really steamy romance and you live in a very conservative Christian type of community. <laughs> You're not going to have a lot of options in terms of who's going to buy your book locally in real life, right? You might have a, a small audience, but generally speaking, it's going to be much harder to find an audience. But if you're online, if you're marketing digitally, those steamy romance readers are going to be, they're going to be there, right? We know that they're there. It's like one of the most popular genres of literature. So you have a lot more access to the specific type of audience who's going to like your books. 
um, the, on the internet and the world at large, more specific audience, than if you're only marketing to the people in your immediate community. So especially, this is especially important, in my opinion, if you write in more niche genres or more niche subgenres, it's going to be harder because the people who like those are going to be fewer and farther. They're going to be more dispersed in the general population. And so it's going to be harder to find them in your immediate community um, in most cases. Uh, so if you do digital marketing and you can target a much wider range of people, then you're going to be more likely to find that specific audience that's going to like your specific work. And then my last reason is that digital marketing is personality compatible. That's what I'm calling it. It's personality compatible in a way that um, IRL marketing isn't. So imagine that you're an introvert like me. Um, there are people who are much more introverted than me, right? IRL marketing is so draining. It is exhausting. I used to do um, craft fairs and comic cons and all kinds of things like that. Um, and I would do at least one a month, sometimes two or three, especially around the holiday season in like November and December, I would sometimes have one every weekend for like eight weeks straight. And I would go to an event and I might only be there for four, maybe six hours, but um, I would be exhausted for like three days after because it's just so draining for me personally on the internet. A lot less draining. Not only that, but I can pick and choose what um, types of marketing I want to do on the internet um, based on my mood. So, like today, I'm in a great mood. I'm having uh, I'm having a good day. I have a lot of energy. So, if I wanted to do like a live stream type of thing, I could totally do that right now. But if I'm having a bad day tomorrow, or maybe the live stream drains me. I could just write a newsletter or I could post a couple times on social media and I don't have to have that face-to-face -face interaction. Now, imagine you're an extrovert and you like engaging with people. Well, you could do live streams every single day and you could respond to DMs every single day. And you could have that kind of um, constant interpersonal connection with other people on the internet more easily even than in real life. So you could do both. You could do a combination of digital and IRL marketing um, but if your marketing focus is digital, you can still choose marketing tactics that um, are more in line with your personality and with your skills and the way that you want to be spending your time. Whereas with IRL marketing, you're much more restricted to a specific set of activities um, in a way that's a little bit different than digital. All right. Those are my pros. I think digital marketing is really cool. I think it's great. Um, I think it allows you to reach a much larger audience. Um, it's infinitely scalable, maybe not infinitely scalable, you know, but it is very scalable in a way that IRL marketing is not. Now, I am going to be fair uh, and throw in a couple cons. So the first con is money. Um, now, I'm not sure that this is necessarily different than IRL marketing, but Money, like the older the internet gets, right, the more platforms kind of become pay to play. I think the most obvious example of this is Facebook. When I joined Facebook, it was like 2007, 2006 or seven, so some, somewhere in there, like uh, my first year of college. And everything was free. You could just post whatever you want, whenever you wanted. And they slowly started adding features. You know, they had pages and they added groups and all of these different things. And you could build an audience for free. But then their algorithm became more and more complex. They started adding like paid advertising options. They started strangling your reach because they wanted you to pay for that type of thing. And so in order to be successful on a platform like Facebook, especially now, um, if you're just getting started now and you haven't been building that audience since 2005, which I guess is when Facebook started, um, you're probably going to have to spend some money and you're probably going to spend a lot of money. Um, I Things in real life, of course, do cost money too. But in real life, a lot of times you have like a flat cost. So it's like, um, you know, you go to a craft fair and it's a $50 fee to set up a table. You pay one time, you show up, you do your thing. Um, whereas with something like Facebook advertising, it's sort of like you pay per impression or you pay per click 
And, you know, the cost can kind of spiral out of control if you're not paying like really specific attention. There's a lot of data involved. There's a lot of analytics to be successful and to actually be generating return on investment. Um, And so the costs are there, but they're also a lot more complicated than most IRL type of marketing um, costs. Um, the second con is you do spend a lot of time on the computer. And if you're the type of person who doesn't like to spend time on computer, either because I don't know, you are, uh, maybe you have some kind of disability, you have like a lot of back pain or, you know, whatever, then there's just a lot of time on the computer. (laughs) Um, maybe you're the type of person who prefers to be out and about and doing things, Um, and you know, IRL marketing is going to be a lot more, um, suited for that type of thing. So there's just a lot of time on the computer. Uh, I mean, it is, it is what it is. Most of us spend a lot of time on the computer anyway, but if you want to do digital marketing, I hate to say it, digital marketing is digital and it means computer time. Now, of course you can do things to, um, help manage that, like get a standing desk, you know, or hire somebody to help you do some of the work, that kind of stuff. But it's just a lot of computer time. And then the third thing is the learning curve for um, digital marketing is high. And the thing that's a little bit different about the learning curve for digital marketing is that it doesn't stop. <laughs> so with like craft fairs and stuff, once you figure out what you're doing, you like, you like, okay, I got my table, I got my setup figured out. I know how to apply for a bunch of events now. You're just kind of doing the same thing over and over and over and over. With digital marketing, the digital world is changing constantly. Um, And especially uh, my spouse and I were talking yesterday about how the dot-com boom in the mid-2000s was like this huge thing and the world was just changing rapidly. Uh, the, uh, The digital world was changing really, really rapidly. We're in the AI boom now. And so things are changing again. And so with digital marketing, you kind of have to go into it expecting that it's going to change, expecting that it's just going to be different. You know, like two years from now, the landscape isn't going to be the same. And so it doesn't mean that you have to know how to do everything as it emerges. Um, Like there have been social media things that people have been super excited about that just never took off like Clubhouse. I don't know if anyone remembers Clubhouse. Um, I think it's still around, but nobody talks about it anymore. (laughs) It was like a um, audio based social media platform. Um, and then there was Google Pl- Plus, Google Plus. I think that's what it was called. It was kind of like an alternative to Facebook, but they shut it down because it wasn't, you know, whatever. So anyway, um, there's a learning curve and you kind of have to understand that you're just going to have to kind of keep learning. You can't just like learn one thing. Now, one thing I will say is that the knowledge builds on itself. So Um, You learn something, you don't necessarily have to learn that exact same thing again. Um, And it does get a little easier, but it doesn't ever stop. Like you're just going to have to keep continually absorbing information uh, about the the internet and digital marketing and the way things work. Um, And so something to keep in mind uh, as you get into digital marketing. All right. Now, I have talked about what marketing is and the difference between digital marketing and IRL marketing. And so the next piece that I want to get into is your writing business. Okay. Um, so are you published? That's my first question. If I do this workshop in real life, which I am tomorrow, (laughs) I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask the audience who here is published in any way, shape or form. Are you, um, indie published, traditionally published? Are you published in like magazine? Maybe you're published in some kind of anthology or you have articles published or maybe you're planning on publishing. And if any of those things are true, then you have at very least the beginnings of some kind of writing business. Now you are under absolutely no obligation whatsoever to turn this into an actual writing business, but you have the foundations. And if it's something that you're interested in doing in the future, it's certainly worth thinking about how are you going to handle um, your writing business? What is it going to look like? What form, what shape is it going to take? So um, I want to talk for a second about what a writing business could look like and one method for visualizing your writing business. Um, 
in the way that I like to talk about it, there are three primary components to a um, writing business. You have your product, distribution, and marketing. And these things are all interrelated. They are, if you imagine like a Venn diagram here, I made a little, I don't know if you can see it in my notes, little product, uh, distribution, and marketing, right? And so you have all of these overlaps here, here, and here. And then there's um, the middle that has all of the overlap, okay? Um, so this is how I like to visualize. So what is a product? Your product, what are you making? <laughs> It could be your books, right? It could be your articles if you're writing articles, um, but it could be other stuff, right? Um, you could think of it, your product is your whole series as opposed to an individual book. So that's where, that's the point that I'm at. My product is not necessarily a single book. My product is a whole series. I'm trying to sell series, not just individual books. Um, maybe you're selling courses. This is particularly common for people who write nonfiction. Um, they teach courses. Um, and they try to sell that as a potential product. Um, consulting, you might do consulting. That might be a product. It might be one product. It might be a primary product. It might be an associated product, whatever. You can also sell stuff like t-shirts or posters or stickers or mugs or something related to your books or whatever it is that you're working on. Um, you could also, as you're defining your product, you can get more specific and more detailed and kind of um, narrow down on your description of it by including things like genre, um, subgenre, maybe your tropes, or if you have multiple pen names, right? All of these things can be used to describe what your product is. So that's your first bubble at the top there. Um, so the second is distribution. So distribution is really important. And I don't think that authors talk about this enough, quite frankly. Um, so what is, what do I mean by distribution? So how are you delivering your product to your audience? Now, if we're talking about something like books, you might have your, your digital books, which is of course the most important thing for this particular workshop, but you might also have your physical books. How are you delivering those? How is your audience accessing those? Um, for physical books, it's shipping is part of that, but most of us aren't managing the actual shipping process. We're using a platform like Amazon or Barnes and Noble or Ingram Spark to deliver those books. That is our distribution. Same thing for ebooks. Most of us aren't emailing ebooks directly to our audience, although email is technically a form of distribution. Most of us are using Amazon or Barnes and Noble or Kobo or Google Play or um, Apple Books, <laughs> um, or one of the many other distributors, Book Funnel. Maybe we're doing direct and we're using like a store like PayHip, or we're using Squarespace or Shopify, something like that, right? We're delivering, we're using a platform to deliver a digital product to our reader. Um, now, I was focusing on indie uh, published there, but your distribution method, if you're not indie published, might be your traditional publishing company. If you're published through, I don't know, Macmillan or Random House or Penguin or something like that, your distribution method might be, oh, I have a traditional publisher and they handle all of that. All of that. That's really important for you to know um, because the way that you distribute your books um, is going to affect what types of marketing that you can do because the way that you distribute your books determines how much control you have over some of your primary um, marketing tools, like your price um, or your book cover, or whether or not you can do something like box sets, right? So your distribution method is absolutely important to consider and to know so that when you're considering marketing, which is going to be our next bubble, you can say, oh, that option is not available to me. This option is not available to me because of my distribution method. Okay. Distribution is very important. So the third bubble, so we have product, then we have distribution, and then we have marketing. All right. How are you telling your audience about your products? Um, of course, you have your IRL options, and then you have your digital options that might look be uh, social media, it might be newsletters, might be paid ads, might be, um, you know, whatever it is that you're doing. There's tons and tons and tons. There's like so many different options for marketing your books and more and more and more come uh, become available all the time. So 
How are you telling your audience about your products? Um, so I, in particular, like to talk about marketing from the context of your specific distribution model um, because different readers prefer different distribution. So for example, you have some readers who are like Amazon exclusive. Maybe they have Kindle Unlimited subscription. Maybe they just find it convenient to buy their books on Amazon. But other readers like refuse to shop on Amazon.com. And so they get their books in other places. They might get their books at the library, in which case you would want to have um, a library distribution in order to access library readers, right? Um, maybe they uh, are kind of like anti-Amazon, and so they've specifically chosen Kobo or iBooks or Google Play to be their primary book provider, in which case, if you want to reach those audience members, you have to actually be on those platforms, right? And if you aren't on those platforms, then there's certain marketing ta tactics that are just not going to be as effective for you. There's no point in trying to reach those people if your books are only on Amazon. Um, and the reverse is true as well. If your books are everywhere, you don't want to only focus on Amazon readers. You want to make sure that you're trying to communicate with readers who prefer distribution on all of the different places. Um, so that is why I think distribution is, is so important. So the next thing I want to talk about is um, I want to talk about two different distribution models that you see commonly talked about in indie publishing. If you are published through a traditional publisher, um, you can, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to post a link to uh, a worksheet that you can work through. Um, you're going to have to do your own brainstorming a little bit. Um, but I'm going to focus on two primary indie distribution methods. And then um, if you're published elsewhere, you can, or in, in a different method, you can, you're, gonna, you're just going to have to do your own legwork. That's really all there is to it. So the first one I want to talk about is the Amazon only distribution method. So there are some authors, if you're not familiar with this, who have part, um, who have, are participating in a program called Kindle Select. Now, in order to be in Kindle Select, you can only distribute your eBooks. Paperbacks or hardcovers are a completely different thing. So we're only talking about eBooks here. You can only distribute your eBooks through Amazon. You cannot have your books on any other platform without being in violation of their terms of service. And this includes selling direct on your own website. Um, I am pretty sure it includes things like Book Funnel or even, you know, Patreon, uh, you know, you can read the terms of service and make your own uh, decisions about that. But most authors say if you're in Kindle, uh, if you're in Kindle Select program, you need to keep your books on Amazon and Amazon alone. All right. So that's the distribution method that we're going to be talking about first. So distribution, so your products on Amazon, if you want to be most effective, you right to market. The readers who focus on Amazon and who only buy on Amazon, they know what they want. They know what they're looking for. They've figured out how to work within the Amazon system. They're going to be getting fed Amazon ads, sponsored ads, and recommendations and all of that stuff. So if you want them to buy your books, then you need to give them what they want. This means writing stories that they want. And in many cases, this means studying the books that are on Amazon and trying to write within these genres and subgenres. Sub this is called writing to market. So the next thing that's really important if you're publishing on Amazon only is to know your genre and your subgenre. Readers on Amazon are looking for very specific things. Um, and if you want to maximize your metadata, maximize your categories, maximize your blurb, maximize your additional content, A plus content is called, all of those things on Amazon you need to know your genre and your subgenre. And related to that, your design must align with genre expectations. And this is really important because if you're on Amazon only, that means that your audience is going to be an Amazon only audience, right? Anybody who shops on Amazon might be a potential audience member for you, but if you want them to see your books, 
if you want them to find your books, it means that you have to think of Amazon as a whole ecosystem. It is really important that your books fit within the Amazon eco ecosystem as effectively as possible. This um, includes both readers who buy books, ebooks on Amazon, but also readers who are in Kindle Unlimited and similar subscriptions. So if you're thinking of Amazon as a whole ecosystem, you are going to want to make sure your product aligns with the expectations of the readers who shop there. And you want to focus your marketing efforts on that specific ecosystem. This means, now, you do not have to do it exactly like this. I just invented the system. <laughs> but this means that you're probably going to want to do things like having a newsletter that's focused on Amazon readers. doesn't matter if you have readers on your newsletter who shop on Google Play because your books just aren't available on Google Play. Um, it also means paying for Amazon ads. It doesn't matter if you pay for BookBub ads necessarily because the BookBub audience certainly has Amazon readers on it, but it's going to be um, less effective um, or it's going to have less efficiency, less efficacious, if you will, um, to focus on BookBub audience, whereas your Amazon ads, they're going to be targeting um, Amazon readers of all sorts, and they're going to be more effective than anybody who's wide who might also be doing Amazon. Um, it also means if you're in Kindle Select, using the Kindle Select promotional features, this might be things like having free days on Amazon. Um, you can have up to five free days every 90 days, I believe. Um, last time I checked, I haven't been in Kindle Select for a while, so it's possible they changed it. But um, using those Kindle countdown deals, you can experiment with those and see if they work. Um, being in Kindle Unlimited and finding and targeting Kindle Unlimited audience members. Um, getting reviews on Amazon specifically. You know, it doesn't matter if you have reviews elsewhere, but Amazon, now Amazon owns Goodreads as well. So focusing on maximizing your Goodreads is also really good. Um, maximizing uh, your, or optimizing is the word I believe I've been looking for this whole time. <laughs> optimizing your product page, making sure you have the best blur possible, making it sure it looks good and it's formatted correctly. Because sometimes with Amazon, the formatting gets all wonky. Um, having A plus content on your books. Um, in order to optimize the page, making sure your categories are correct. And if they're not correct, emailing them, making sure your details are correct. Sometimes Amazon miscalculates how many pages a book has and little things like that can just make it screwy. Making sure the pub date is right, optimizing your page to be accurate and optimizing your page um, so that all of the details and metadata is 100% correct. Um, I also think that if you have an Amazon specific audience, then you are going to want to focus more on hard launches, not necessarily all the time. You do a hard launch so that every time you release a new book, your Amazon specific audience knows that it's there and they're going to go out and get it. Amazon is going to send out an email saying you have a new book out to your audience, um, but having a launch and making people feel like they are part of um, your brand and making them feel like they're part of this, you know, universe that you're creating that's specific to Amazon is going to be really good. Um, having an Amazon specific street team of people who can connect to other Amazon readers who will leave reviews on your books, who will talk about your books, who will participate in your, you know, I don't know, your Facebook group, who will do things like, um, share on social media, right? You want Amazon readers talking to Amazon readers. So having a street team to manage your word of mouth for you is going to be really useful. Um, doing pre-orders so that when your Amazon readers uh, get to the end of the book, they can see that the next book will be available if it's not available yet um, and kind of maximizing um, that as sort of part of your process. And at least on Amazon, ranking does make a little bit of a difference. It makes a lot less a difference than it did what year is it 2024 we'll say less than 10 years ago it made a huge difference so it makes less of a difference now but it still matters um and so paying attention to your rank at very least and you can you can do promos and stacking promos and that type of thing to kind of get ranking boosts periodically 
Um, but the higher you rank, the more visible your book is, um, and the more algorithm credibility uh, your book will have. So you can care about rank as opposed to someone who is wide, which is the next distribution model that I'm going to talk about, where you rank on Amazon doesn't really matter. Um, so if I was going to give you one piece of advice, if you are having an Amazon specific um, distribution model, it is to think of Amazon as a whole ecosystem. All of the moving pieces within Amazon are important and you should do what you can to optimize for that specific ecosystem. Whatever that looks like, however you want to handle it and manage it, optimize for the Amazon ecosystem. Okay, so the second distribution model that I wanted to talk about today is the what, what is called the wide distribution model. So wide is not Amazon only. Now, you can still publish your books on Amazon, but you will not be in the Kindle Select program. Because remember, to be in Kindle Select and thus in Kindle Unlimited, you have uh, you cannot publish your books anywhere else. So what the wide distribution model means is that you're publishing your ebook on as many platforms as possible. This includes, but is not limited to, Amazon, as well as other platforms like Barnes & Noble, Kobo, Google Play, Apple Books, um, Direct. You can use Draft to Digital to get to some of the smaller ones. Um, maybe it's Smashwords or Everand or um, there's a lot. <laughs> there's a lot. You can put them on BookBub. So your distribution model is essentially making your book available to readers in as many different places as possible. This means that you have access not only to Amazon readers, but you also have access to readers who prefer to read on other apps, on other devices, um, and who spend their reading hours in other places. So <clears throat> that's distribution. That's our first element, right? Products. So if you're wide, how does this affect what products you're producing? Well, first of all, I would argue, and this is an argument, I do not have data to back this up. I think you can have more flexibility in product offerings. And Kindle Unlimited and Amazon, readers tend to like to read variations on the same themes over and over and over and over and over. Wide readers tend to have, I guess, broader expectations for what products are available. So if your books don't fit into a really specific niche or subgenre, um, wide might be a good choice for you because it means that you have more options to hit a wider audience of different people in different places who have different access to different platforms. Um, and their expectations are going to be a little bit less specific um, because the algorithms on the different sites do not work like the algorithm on Amazon. Um, this is, I would also say it gives you a little bit more flexibility in terms of design. It is good for your design to align with the genre or the subgenre that you're in, but it is not like a hundred percent necessary. Um, especially if you write in like middle of the road genres, if you like to write in holes in the market, as opposed to in the center of the market, <clears throat> um, you have a little bit more flexibility and the decisions that you make when it comes to design, when it comes to storytelling and that's that type of thing. So what does this mean for marketing? Well, to be clear, I'm a wide author and what I'm gonna tell you is the method that I'm currently using um, for the most part. This is not the only way that you can market your book if you're wide. This is just one method um, and it's one that I particularly like because I figured out how to do it and it aligns with my personality. Um, but you can do lots of different methods um, when it comes to marketing wide books, depending on you and what you want and what your resources are. So the way that I do it is I have the first book in every series that I have is free. Every single series, the first book is free. Um, this means that anybody can get it on any platform. Sometimes Amazon's a pain in the butt. Um, and so I have to like go over there and like get them to drop the price to zero. Um, but all of my books are free most of the time. Uh, all of my first books in the series are free. The rest of the series, on the other hand, costs money. So what this enables me to do is market only the first book in the series. So um, I just 
I use all different kinds of marketing methods for the first book. I post on social media and I have my newsletter and I use platforms like um, Written Word Media or Fussy Librarian or E-Reader News Today, um, BookBub. Um, and so I've gotten a few future deals on BookBub. I use BookBub advertising and these platforms allow me to reach a much wider audience than just the Amazon audience. People download my book. Sometimes they read and buy the rest of the series immediately. More often, what I've seen is slow growth over time. Um, so I might have like a huge surge of downloads now, and then I ha um, I see sales later on. I have no idea what they're associated with because it's something that happened in the past because they finally got around to reading my book. Um, I also like this method because it allows me not to do hard launches. So just briefly, the difference between a hard launch and a soft launch is that a hard launch is a launch where you plan everything out in advance. You had like a you have like a day when it goes live and you do all these kinds of you might have a party or an online party or you know, you've been creating this huge marketing push around the day the book goes live. A soft launch, you kind of publish the book and then you tell people after the fact. You might tell the people the day of and then but people weren't necessarily expecting it or waiting for it, right? It's just kind of a different um way of focusing. So by having my first book in the series free, majority of my marketing time and money is focused on that book. So if I pu publish book five in the series, of course, I'm going to tell my audience, I'm going to send out a newsletter and post it on social media, but I'm not doing this huge marketing push on that book. I can do a soft launch or no launch like I did with this one. I just launched. I haven't even sent out a newsletter yet. <laughs> it's been, it's been a week. <laughs> um, so I really like that because it allows me to kind of be a little bit more flexible about my marketing and my schedule and those types of things, which works really well for my personality and also my, just like my life in general. My dog is looking at me. Say hello, Blueberry. <laughs> um, anyway, so uh, you can do whatever type of launch you want. You can do whatever type of marketing you want. You can come in and out because their first book is free. Um, you know, it, it gives, in my personal opinion, a lot more flexibility. Now that said, um, it's definitely a personality thing. <laughs> um, you can also do pre-orders if you want, don't have to do pre-orders. You can, you know, have really specific publishing schedule. If you want, don't have to have a really specific publishing schedule. Um, ranking tends to be irrelevant because your sales are going to be spread across platforms. You're not going to have the, uh, you're not going to have all of your sales on one platform. Um, so this means that you can just kind of ignore the Amazon ranking because I mean, you can, you can try to do a push to get Amazon readers and Amazon sales and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But you also don't have to. So in my opinion, this particular method has a lot more flexibility than the Amazon one, but the main downside of it is that it means you have to manage a lot of different moving pieces. You have all different platforms that you have to keep track of. Um, your sales are going to be way spread out. Um, you're going to want to get reviews on as many platforms as you can. Whereas if you're Amazon specific, right, you're only worried about reviews on Amazon. Um, you have a lot wider range of um, marketing options that are going to be, you know, they're going to have a range of effectiveness. It means more tracking. It means more management. So more flexibility, but it's also a little more complicated. I would say the learning curve is a lot higher. Um, and so there's just like a lot more moving pieces. So it's really about what you want, where you're going, what your goals are, what your personality is like, whether you choose to do Amazon only and think of that as a singular ecosystem that you're focused on or whether you want to go wide. Now, you don't actually have to do one or the other. You can mix and match, you know, for example, um, you can only be in Kindle Unlimited if you're not published elsewhere per book. So let's say you have a series that's really specific to a subgenre that does really well on Amazon, but then you also have a series that's a little bit more experimental, for example. And so one series you have in Kindle Unlimited and another series you have wide. Downside to doing this is that you know, your audience might be, have to be segmented, right? Because you have an Amazon specific audience, but then you also have a wide audience, but like, honestly, whatever, do what you want, experiment, figure it out. Um, I also am only focused on indie, 
but you could be a hybrid author. Maybe you um, have some books that are in Kindle Unlimited, some books that are wide, and some books that are published through a traditional publisher or a small press. I have some books that are published through anthologies, in anthologies, either just like groups of other authors, or I have a couple that are with a small press. So you can do whatever you want, however you want. You can mix and match. Just make sure you understand the rules. That's really important. Um, and make sure you have a plan and you know what you want to do, how you want to be spending your money. Um, and I really, really do recommend sitting down and just like organizing your time, organizing your money, organizing your products and figuring out what your goals are. Now I'm saying this from the perspective of an author who has a really lot of books, right? Like I'm into my, the forties in terms of numbers. Um, other people only have one or two books. And so a lot of these different pieces aren't really going to be relevant to necessarily at this point, but it's worth thinking about. It's worth paying attention to. Um, and, um, you can do it. Um, I have one more page of notes. Oh, I'll tell you about this first. So this is the worksheet that I made that I'm going to link to. Sorry, I, my printer is running out of ink, so it's a little faint, but I have your, you know, fancy schmancy thing. can't really read it. I apologize for that. Um, the question is, what is your product up here? Um, and it's just, I put lines so you can think about it if you want to, or you can write in a notebook or you can draw pictures. I don't care. This is just a guide for thinking mostly. How do you distribute your work? So you can write here how you do or how you want to. And then this one is how will you market your books? You can write some stuff there if you want to. Then on the back, I have some selling books in a digital world, an incomplete guide. And so here's just a bunch of options that you can consider when you are doing, um, when you're like coming up with your marketing plan and figuring out what you want to do or what you don't want to do. And then I put a box down here to bring some of your own ideas. You do not need to print this out. But some people like to do things by hand, you know, and scribble. And sometimes it's good for brainstorming to use your hand to do things. So I just made this. I'll link to it. <laughs> All right. So my last page, it's just kind of like a hodgepodge of things that I think are interesting and worth talking about. The first one is I wanted to talk briefly about BookBub. Everybody talks about BookBub like it's just like magic genie in a bottle, and it's not. I've had four BookBub deals. Um, well, so I've had two free feature deals. I've had one new book deal, and I've had one chirp deal. Um, and I've had different levels of success in all of them. Um, I considered all of them to be worth it. I also now have a pretty large audience on BookBub. I think I'm up at like 50,000 people either follow me or have downloaded my books on you on BookBub, which is a pretty crazy number. And I'm very proud. Like I have more people following me. Um, and I know this because I've targeted ads at my own name. Um, so if you target, if you go and you set up an ad and you pick an author, it'll tell you what their reach is. And mine is like around 50,000. So I have a bigger reach on BookBub than some like really famous authors. <laughs> so that feels kind of good. Um, so um, a couple tips about BookBubs, um, because everybody wants to know how to get a BookBub. And I don't know. <laughs> yeah, they, they're their own thing and they do their own thing. So here's a few piece of it, is it pieces of advice for you. The first is to manage your expectations. You're not going to get a BookBub every month. It's just not going to happen. Even really famous authors, like I follow Neil Gaiman and he gets like a book bub like twice a year. And I imagine they, they have like a really good uh, results when they have a Neil Gaiman deal. So um, yeah, he gets like two a year, maybe three. Um, the second is to submit regularly. Uh, you can't get a deal unless you're submitting and you kind of got to get used to those rejection emails. They I get them every month. I get between, you know four and seven, depending on how lazy I'm being on the day that I do my submissions. Um, so just, you just kind of got to suck it up and do it regularly, keep track. So you aren't, um, accidentally submitting too soon and just, you know, follow the rules. Um, make sure you have good covers on your books and make sure the editing is solid. Uh, because they will reject you over and over and over and over and over and over and over again for those reasons. Um, having reviews on your book is really good. Um, and having like 
four-star review rating or higher is going to be your best bet. You can use platforms like Book Sirens or Book Sprout or I think Story Origin has a review thing. Um, you can do other promos on your book. Um, so yeah. Also publish wide. Um, that's going to be a, a good way to increase your chances of getting a book bub. The book bub audience is wide. And so if you think about it, book bub's primary goal is to create an audience for you. So they need to give their audience what their audience wants. And if their audience is, want, is wide, then they're going to want to give them wide books, which means that if your book is wide, you're more likely to get a book bub. Now, that's not to say that you can't get a book bub if you're in Google, uh, in Kindle Unlimited. Um, people certainly do, um, but you increase your chances by being wide. Um, another piece of advice that I would say is don't bother with BookBub if you don't have a series because you're most likely to get a deal. Oh, I just realized I had a 99 cent deal one time. I guess I've had five BookBubs. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Um, you, the, the whole like pitch for Ant, for BookBub is that they either do free or they do heavily discounted books. So have a series. You don't want to like have a book that's heavily discounted and then not have anything else for your readers to buy. Otherwise, you're just spending money for no particular reason. Um, this is a really good um, first free and series method. Um, so even if your book, your first book isn't free, you can still apply for BookBubs. You just have to make sure you get it free before the actual BookBub deal, which isn't that hard. Um, my next piece of advice is to think of BookBub as its own ecosystem, the same way you might think of Amazon as its own ecosystem. So don't just submit to BookBub. Um, fill out your profile, put up your own, you know, put up reviews, um, use their ads, um, make sure all your books are on their platform. Uh, if you do reviews, make sure you're posting your reviews on BookBub and uh, put up a photo, you know, just think of it as a, an ecosystem. Try to get followers. Um, book sweeps does bookbub profile um, promos that you can participate in. I think the last time I got like 150 followers, the last time I did a book sweeps. So it's certainly worth looking into, um, yeah, but think of it as a whole ecosystem. Box sets and good deals. So what kind of offer can you make to bookbub readers that is better than any other offer? Um, I'm actually working on two box sets right now. And so I'm going to start submitting those as soon as I, um, in the form that you fill out when you submit for a free, free feature deal, there is a box at the very bottom that says additional comments or something like that. Write something there. I don't always, but write something there. Tell them why you think they should choose your book. It might be um, something like, you know, my book got an award. It might be something like, I am going to be doing this like huge promotion and uh, I'm going to have my whole series discounted. Um, whatever it is, whatever reason you can give. Now, that's not going to guarantee that they're going to choose your books, certainly, but it is 100% worth um, talking. I mean, they're real people who are doing the choosing. Um, so be nice, be professional, um, be pleasant and tell them anything that might help them make their job a little easier. Anything that might help them make the decision. Um, and then my last piece of advice is publish more series. The more books that you have that you can submit to BookBub, the more likely you are to get a deal. I mean, that's just like basic math. So um, unless somebody at BookBub particularly hates you personally, uh, just publish more series. You don't have to finish every series before you start another one. I mean, maybe you do. I shouldn't say that because different people have different processes and, and methods and, and, you know, whatever. But if you're the type of person who can work on multiple series at once, do it. Do it. Um, <clears throat> the other thing people don't actually know about BookBub is that if you release a new book, and then claim it on BookBub, they send out a new release email. So even just that is like free marketing. If you have an audience on BookBub, those people will get an email that says, you know, Ariel Ceiling released a new book. Here it is. Um, and that's worthwhile. And I usually get at least a couple of sales when I release a new book from that email. So worth it. 
All right. Um, I also wanted to talk briefly about serial publishing, and I'm spelling that S-E-R-I-A-L, not like Captain Crunch. <laughs> serial publishing has become more popular in recent years. It's very popular in, in Asian countries. Um, Kindle Vela is the Amazon version. Um, Radish is uh, another really common one that people use. You could also use something like Wattpad or a subscription platform like um, Substack or Patreon or Ream or something like that. So serial publishing is basically, it's what Charles Dickens did, where you write a story, but you break it up into smaller seg- subsections and you release them like every week or, you know, on a regular schedule. Um, You can't just take a longer work and break it up into chunks. You have to actually follow a serial story structure. Um, And you do have to be able to commit to regular releases. I have thought about doing serial publishing, but I just, it's just like not my personality. So Um, this is a newer method with less proven strategies. Um, But if you're doing this, what I recommend is following the, the, you know, the system You want to do serial distribution. What products would work well for serial distribution? And are you capable of publishing those, um, on writing those? And then when you do your marketing, focus on the serial audience. Don't worry about people who don't want serial stuff, right? Like I don't read serials, so I would not be your audience. So work on finding ways um, to target those specific audiences. Uh, I don't know much about serial marketing personally, but I would imagine things like newsletters, RSS fees, those types of things are going to be your friend when it comes to finding, engaging, and maintaining a serial audience. And then the other thing I want to mention briefly before I sign off is um, that I think it's always worth it to consider multiple revenue streams when it comes to publishing. Publishing is not a particularly, um, there's a word. It's not it's not a career that makes a lot of money for the large majority of people who publish. Um, some people, super successful, they get really lucky or, you know, they just hit the market at the right time. Sure. But the large majority of authors don't really make they don't make a living wage when it comes to publishing. And they do it because they're passionate about it. They do it because they're passionate about writing or because they're passionate about publishing itself or they have a story that they want to share. Um, so there's lots of other revenue streams that you can you can get. Um, co- coaching and consulting is really common, particularly if you have like a very specific area of expertise um, or if you're writing nonfiction, it's really common. Um, you can give workshops or you can teach. Um, you can do subscription, things like pa- Patreon or Substack or Ream is the new one for authors. Um, a lot of writers do freelance writing or freelance marketing for, um, companies like corporate places pay the most money. So, um, you can set up products that are either associated with your series or just for fun. Um, t-shirts, posters, there's lots of drop shipping companies like Redbubble or, um, Zazzle or places like that, that you can use, um, to create, to create that type of stuff. Um, YouTube videos with ads. I don't have ads set up on my YouTube videos yet, um, but you could potentially do that if you are interested in that. Um, you can do affiliate linking. Um, Joanna Penn has a bunch of information about affiliate links that you can check out. Um, you can try doing, you know, IRL marketing, uh, in addition to digital marketing and you can have a job. You can have a part-time job. You can have a full-time job. You can, you know, babysit, you can do gig work like, um, DoorDash or I don't know, um, what's that grocery shopping one? Instacart. (laughs) So um, there is no shame if you don't make enough money to pay your bills from publishing. Um, And I just like to mention that kind of at the end, because I feel like there's a lot of pressure, especially in the indie industry. People are like, well, if you're not making a lot of money, then you're doing it wrong. And that's just, that's just not true. (laughs) That's just not true. So um, do what you got to do. And, uh, figure out a system and, um, just keep rolling one thing at a time. Try not to burn out because the number one way that, uh, you're going to shoot your business in the foot is by burning out. Cause you are the engine, you're the motor in your writing business. So one thing at a time, don't stress out, take your time, learn what you got to learn. 
and all that jazz. Thank you for watching. I'm Ariel Ceiling. Uh, you can find my work at arielceiling.com. I will put that link below. Also, I'm supposed to say something like, um, please follow and share because I am also trying to run a business. <laughs> you don't have to, but if you found this useful, please feel free to follow. Follow me on YouTube and share. That's all. Have a great day.